Okay, so for today's lecture, we are going to, well, actually, we're not going to do image contrast, but we will pick up our discussion of functional MRI. We'll talk about diffusion imaging, um, and then talk a little bit about phase contrast and time of flight angiography, and then um, talk a little bit about portable MRI as well. <clears throat> So as we discussed last time, um, the main idea is that we are going to um, use the MRI for functional MRI to study brain function. And the main thing is that we are going to focus, we said we mostly focus on R2 star, which is the relaxation time constant or the rate, relaxation rate. Um, and that depends on deoxyhemoglobin. And what we found was that um, as the amount of deoxyhemoglobin increases, then that leads to more magnetic field homogeneities. And therefore, there's going to be more dephasing of the spins. That's going to lead to a decrease in MR signal. And that also means that the, the rate of decay increases. And so I think there was uh, one question on the, the quiz, which was uh, basically saying as more deoxyhemoglobin increases, then what happens is there is more dephasing and also the... Um, the transverse relaxation rate, the R2 star will also increase, okay? So more dephasing means spins get out of phase more quickly, therefore the relaxation rate increases. So R2 star would increase. And we talked a little bit about how the, um, the relationship between the two was um, uh, a relationship between the, the blood flow and the oxygen metabolism. Uh, such that for, um, you know, basically as cerebral blood flow increases, that leads to decreases in deoxyhemoglobin. And as CMR2 increases, that leads to increases in deoxyhemoglobin. So there's this sort of uh, battle between blood flow increasing, uh, make trying to make the MR signal go up and metabolism increase in trying to make the MR signal go down. And it's the competition that gives rise to the bold fMRI signal. And in particular, because that coupling ratio is typically about two to one, where increases in CBF outstrip increases in CMR2 by about two to one. That's why for most cases, we end up with a positive bold signal. Okay, so we did some of these questions last time. Um, so let's, let's just focus on this question this time. So. Uh, let me open up the poll now, and um, let's see. Okay, so the question is, if there's a functional increase in metabolism, uh, what will that tend to do to the, the bold signal? So assuming everything else is equal, um, we have an um, increase in the uh, sort of the metabolic rate, what will, what will happen to the bold signal? Will it increase or decrease in terms of, will the MR signal go up or down? Okay, about 10 more seconds. Let's wait for the last votes to come in. Okay, so let's take a look at the results here. So uh, almost uh, equal split. So some people said it would increase, some people said it would decrease. So let's work through this. So if I have an increase in CMRO2, okay, so I'm using up more oxygen. So let's say that increases, then I'm gonna have more deoxyhemoglobin, right? Okay. So that means that I'm going to have more dephasing, right? And that means that the spin at, at any given point in time, the MR signal will tend to be decreased. And so that's going to, uh, all things being equal, uh, the CMR2 signal will tend to decrease um, the bolt signal if, if that's the only thing going on, right? We talked a little bit about mind reading. And so, for example, um, these are some more recent results from, uh, I think, a couple of years ago, 2018, showing what the sort of the state of the art was about two years ago. And so these on the top row, you're sort of seeing the photos that the, the subjects were exposed to. And then what they did was they trained um, 
I believe, a convolutional neural network to uh, basically from previous MR data where people were exposed to sort of uh, visual building blocks, then they tried to reconstruct what the um, the person was actually seeing. So you can see it pretty, does pretty well in terms of the overall sort of shape and, and even some of the texture and, and sort of the, you know, the colors of the, um, of the photograph, but we're still not quite at the point where just by looking at someone's brain alone, you can sort of tell exactly what they're looking at. Uh, the other thing that's sort of interesting that you can do with fMRI is you can use it sort of for biofeedback. And so, for example, um, <clears throat> as a person is lying in the scanner, you can look at their fMRI signal in a certain part of their brain, and you can ask them to try to control um, what part of the brain that is. So to sort of say how that that's sort of, you know, um, you know, not that easy to do, you know, I'd like each of you to sort of imagine that you want to increase the fMRI signal in your um, prefrontal cortex. <clears throat> and I want to, dec you, to decrease, the, decrease the signal in your hippocampus and increase the fMRI signal in your amygdala. Okay. So everyone done that? Okay. So if you know something about brain anatomy and functional anatomy, you might be able to come up with sort of things that you might do to um, increase activity in your amygdala. For example, uh, amygdala is often involved with things like fear and emotional responses. So you could think of something very scary and, and maybe that would increase the, the, um, the uh, response in your amygdala. But in general, it's not gonna be that easy for you to, to directly uh, modulate uh, your brain activity without some sort of feedback. But it turns out that the brain is, is very adaptive um, does the overall volumetric blood flow to the brain change or the difference between responsible, the local the region responsible for processing said task? Uh, that's a great question. So it turns out that, you know, the, the blood flow does increase in terms of like, there might be a percent change of say, typically for something like a visual task, there might be an increase of up to 50% or more in the blood flow, but it does, does tend to be fairly localized. Now, uh, there are things you can do, such as breathing carbon dioxide that will increase blood flow overall. Um, or you could, if you hyperventilate, that will decrease blood flow over your whole brain region. So there are physiological things you can do. But it turns out that the brain, even at resting state, is already using up a lot of energy. And so the, the, the percent changes you're seeing in terms of how much more you know, oxygen it's using is, is actually quite um, small and, and localized. And in fact, what we'll see is in a few slides, we're gonna see that we can actually use that resting state activity to map the brain. So even though you're not doing a task, the brain's always doing something and it's always burning a lot of energy, okay? Um, so this is an experiment where the subject was basically shown activity in this region of their brain. And so we basically, they just displayed, you know, whether that activity was going up or down. And they were told to, after some training told to based on that signal, just whether they could make that, that activity go up or down. And you can sort of see that they can do fairly well in terms of this is the, the subject actually trying to make the activity in their brain go up and down and up and down. And not even knowing exactly where it is, but just by giving the feedback, it turns out the brain is pretty good at um, being able to uh, adapt itself and, and, and control itself. So this may have, this is sort of was very early on, there was a lot of hope that these types of um, methods might be helpful for dealing with, you know, people could be trained to, uh, you know, reduce their craving for drugs or deal with other um, mental or, or psychological issues that they had. Um, it turns out that that promise really hasn't paid off yet. Uh, it's there, there's still a lot of variability between subjects and, um, it's, it's also quite expensive to do it. And so it's, it's not, it's, it's a good idea, um, but it's not quite uh, uh, fulfilled as promised yet. So getting to what we just talked about, what we've talked about so far is task related BOLD and BOLD stands for blood oxygenation level dependent signals. And so the idea is that for most, for I would say, you know, maybe the first um, 15 years of fMRI, pretty much all of fMRI was task-related fMRI, where you basically had subjects and they're doing tasks. And you would see what they're doing 
um, when they were doing a task and looking at what areas of the brain are active while they're doing the task and also how active you know what um, that brain was and, and how that compared to the brain during other tasks. So there's a completely different paradigm um, which is called resting state fMRI. So if I just put someone in a scanner and, and, and this is a movie here that I'm playing of the fluctuations in your brain of someone's brain as they're lying in the scanner, it appears fairly random. But you know, if you look at it, it's not completely random. Right, I mean, there, you could maybe convince yourself that there are some structures there and maybe there are some repetition, okay? Although it's certainly true, if I were to say sit on one area of the brain, let's say I was sitting on this area of the brain here and looking at its signal, that signal would appear to be fairly random. Okay. But it's a very uh, simple experiment to do. I mean, you essentially put the person in the scanner and you, they can have their eyes open or their eyes closed and you simply scan as they are um, uh, having their fMRI uh, measurements done. So it turns out that the amazing thing is that that resting state signal exhibits a lot of structure to it, both across space and time. And so for example, if we were to pick some area here in the brain and look at its response, let's say in blue, okay. On its own, it looks like it's just going up and down sort of in random fashion. But if we sort of take another signal here, and let's say this is the green signal, you can see those, those two signals look very much alike, even though they're in different parts of the brain. And, and the reason for that is they're both part of the primary motor cortex, all right? So one way we could map primary motor cortex is obviously we could just have someone tap their fingers. And this is a traditional bolt response map showing those areas of the brain that light up when someone's tapping their fingers. But you could also come up with what's called a resting state correlation map, where the way this map was uh, designed is we took the signals, let's say the blue signal, okay, from this part of the brain, and we just asked the question, what other parts of the brain go up and down in the same way as that signal? And so we can form a correlation map. And as you can see, sort of this correlation map, just while the subject is resting very quietly in the scanner, uh, looks remarkably like the task-related uh, bolt fMRI signal. Or the, the map, and so this was a this discovery was first made uh, back in 1995, where um, graduate student Brock Biswal at the Medical College of Wisconsin um, made this discovery with his advisor Jim Hyde. And um, I like to tell the story here because it, it you know many of the findings in fMRI and MRI are from graduate students, and in this case, it was such a controversial finding. Um, I believe the paper, if I remember correctly, was rejected at least three times. Okay, so imagine you're a grad student, this is your grad work, and every time you get, try to get it published, it is rejected three times or, or more. And so uh, ultimately, uh, Jim Hyde, the advisor, you know, had to sort of intervene and, and help get the, the paper published. Um, now, fast forward, um, you know, 25 years later, this is now the stand, one of the standard methods, the basis for you know, thousands and thousands of studies all over the world. Um, and it's really become a very important part of human neuroscience. Uh, one of the reasons it's become so popular is because it's a, you're able to, just by looking at people in the resting state alone, you're able to identify and measure and characterize different uh, brain networks in their brain. Uh, so for example, you can look at their visual network, you can pick up what's called the default mode network, uh, attention networks, auditory networks, sensory motor networks. And you get all this information simultaneously. Okay, so all these, all your brain's always talking to itself. And so you can actually characterize the functional connections in the brain um, with like a five or 10 minute scan and sort of see how well is the brain talking to itself. So this was um, the basis of what's called the HCP project or the Human Connectome Project, which scanned over a thousand people and was really the, the sort of tour de force NIH funded study to really use functional connectivity and diffusion MRI, which we'll talk about next, to uh, really map out the brain. And so this is a sort of state of the art parcellation of the brain. Um, you know, in the old days, this would be done by taking brain samples, cutting them up, sampling them, um, this is all done non-invasively and in healthy adults and really um, sort of this unprecedented sort of mapping of the human brain and dividing it up into different functional regions. Okay, so um, 
quite remarkable that you know only say 30 or 40 years after the invention of MRI that this technology is now being used regularly to sort of non-invasively measure uh, brain connectivity and function. Okay, so that's all we're gonna do about fMRI. I think there are some projects on fMRI, so we will certainly get to those. Um, so we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about moving spins. And so, uh, so far we've sort of assumed that, you know, we're looking at a static picture or we're looking at something where the spins are, maybe they're, you know, they're moving, but we're really not focused on their movement. We're just focused on their contrast, say in fMRI, it was the T2 SAR contrast that we carried about. Now for the next two topics, which are diffusion and uh, phase contrast and geography, uh, we're gonna look at what happens when spins move and how do we take advantage of that to um, get even more information about a biological sample? Because you know most interesting biological samples have something that's moving, um, whether it be with water or blood or other types of fluids. So the thing we're gonna talk about first is diffusion. And I think most of you are familiar with the concept of diffusion. And so the idea is that um, uh, if you have sort of a, 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 some particles, let's say you have some perfume and you bring it into a room and you open up the bottle, then those particles will diffuse out um, into the room, okay? And the longer you wait, the more things will diffuse, all right? And so they're, des they're sort of, uh, if you look at sort of the diffusion distance, which is sort of the main distance, you know, how far something diffuses, that distance is proportional to square root of some factor times the diffu diffusivity. So that's the diffusivity. And that's the time you wait, okay? So the longer you wait, the more things are gonna spread out the more easily things diffuse in a in the medium, the more things will spread out. Uh, and so this is sort of shown here by this uh, profile where you start off with this probability profile of where the particles are, and over time it follows this Gaussian spreading. And so you basically have this spreading in space of, of the particles. And so you can sort of see, we have 1D, 2D, and 3D in terms of you can sort of imagine in 3D, basically that sphere is becoming bigger and bigger in terms of um, the probability of, of where those, those spins are, okay? So what we wanna do next is we wanna think about how we can use fMRI to actually measure diffusion. And this turns out to be an important, incredibly important tool, both clinically and for research purposes. And so I think it's worth talking about so the thought experiment we wanna do is we wanna imagine two spins, let's call them A and B, okay? And we're gonna assume that um, they're in the presence of a gradient field here, okay? So there's, and, and in this case, it's a gradient X direction, and let's say it's got a minus, it's a minus gradient. So it's, it's decreasing in the X direction. Now, we assume that these spins can just move randomly, right? They're diffusing, and so, they're moving around. And so they're gonna start this spin, for example, move to a stronger part of the gradient, whereas this spin moved to a weaker part of the gradient. Okay. So we look at them at, after some point in time, they all have accused different, accrued different phases because they're in different parts of the magnetic field. And so you can sort of see where they started off with the phases being in the same direction or being in phase, now they're a little bit out of phase. And then we can apply a gradient in the opposite direction for the same amount of time. So this is a plus GX gradient. And if we let the spins go evolve even more, some that, you know, they randomly move. So this might move back here, this maybe moves out a little farther here. And the idea is because they're, they're moving around, they're not experiencing the same magnetic field that they felt during the first half of, of the experiment. If they did, then, they would just recover their phase and they'd be back at phase of zero. But since they're sort of just randomly moving around, they become even more out of phase, okay? And the longer we wait, the more they're gonna get out of phase. So what this is gonna do is this is gonna, it's gonna lead to a decrease in the MRI signal, right? Because as they diffuse, this is gonna lead to dephasing. 
And so it turns out that we can use that sort of overall decrease in the MR signal as something that's proportional to diffusion. Uh, the way we do that is essentially this is the implementation of what we just described. We might excite with a 90 degree pulse to get the spins into the transverse plane. Then we apply a diffusion gradient in one, you know, plus gradient. We wait some amount of time, delta, and we apply diffusion in the opposite with the opposite sign. Okay. So what's the advantage? What's the impact of that? Well, without diffusion, but if the spins are all aligned here, we apply a gradient, they get out of phase, okay? Then we turn off the gradient, so there's no further phase accumulated in this period. And then here we reverse the gradient. And you notice if these two gradients are equal and opposite, then that's, that's equal and opposite area. And remember from where we are in K space, where we are in K space is just the integral of any gradients that we see. So we'd expect the spins to be totally rephased and we're back at the center of K space um, if there's no movement, okay? So if there's no movement, what we talked about before with gradients is simply the K space picture. Now with diffusion, what we're gonna assume is we're gonna assume that this spin is moving, okay? All the other spins are stationary. So what happens is this spin here, they all accumulate the same amount of phase, but now this spin moves around here such that it doesn't experience the refocusing that these other two spins does, and so it ends up with some net phase, okay? Because it moved to some other part of the field. And so whatever it was wound up with, it sort of didn't experience the equal and opposite rewinding of, of this phase. Here's another picture here where showing whether we have a weak gradient or a strong gradient. And so you can sort of see where this, this dephasing, okay? And even during this mixing period, things are sort of moving around such that they can experience different parts of the field. And then they rephase here. And if we have a very weak gradient, then there's not gonna be too much dephasing, right? Because the magnetic field is not too different um, for different spins in different places. But if we have a very strong gradient, then there's going to be um, <clears throat> more dephasing because spins, as they move around, experience much uh, more homogeneity in the magnetic field. <clears throat> so it turns out that the MR signal we measure can be expressed as EXP minus BD, where D is the diffusivity. Okay. And B is what's called the B factor. And as you can sort of see, it depends on both gradient strength and also how long we wait. So the longer we wait, obviously things can move around to different parts of the field. And so there's also gonna be more dephasing, right? So the nice thing is we can, B factor is something that we can tune. That's, that's determined by our pulse sequence. And so we can sort of measure diffusivity at different B factors, and then we can try to fit or estimate what the diffusivity is. So that's shown here. So, you know, if we have S is, the signal is EXP minus B times ADC. This is sort of our standard for the, the diffusivity. It's the apparent diffusion coefficient, ADC, because it's sort of what we measure. We don't necessarily know what the true diffusivity is, but here we're trying to estimate what it is. And so if something has an exponential dependence on ADC, then if we take the log of both sides, it's just gonna fit a line where this line is a line minus B times ADC, okay? So if we know B, then we can figure out what the ADC is by, by fitting the slope of that line. Okay, where we varied the B factor here. So we could do an experiment where we vary the B factor and measure the signal at different B factors. And then by fitting that line, we um, end up with uh, our estimate for ADC. And so why is this important? Well, it turns out that this actually um, has a very important application, especially uh, one of the more uh, predominant applications of this is for stroke. Okay, so stroke, as many of you know, is, is when there's, uh, blood flow is blocked to some region of the brain. And if it is, um, if nothing is done to treat it, then that brain region can die. Um, and, and then the person will experience some functional loss. Um, in some cases, if you catch it soon enough and you, you, may, you, you, you get rid of the block and deliver blood flow back to that part of the brain, then you may be able to recover some of the tissue. Um, 
but that's still an area of sort of both clinical research and, and sort of development. But let's look at this. So this is what we have here is we have a T2-weighted image here where we're sort of seeing the very bright CSF. But if you look at this image, this T2-weighted image, um, you know, unless you maybe really were expert in this, it wouldn't really stand out that there was something necessarily wrong with this brain. I mean, you could zoom in on it and say, well, it looks a little different, but it's not clear that you would immediately say that this person had uh, an issue with their brain. Okay. Whereas if you have a DW diffusion weighted image, so this stands for diffusion weighted image, um, then it's very clear that there's something going on in this part of the brain. Okay. And if you do an ADC map, you sort of see that the ADC is lower here, right? And so that makes sense. If I have something that's e to the minus b times ADC, as ADC gets lower, then this whole thing should get stronger. Okay. So the idea is in the part of the brain that is, seems to be damaged by the stroke, water doesn't diffuse as well. And therefore, there's not going to be as much dephasing. So the MR signal will go up in that part of the brain. And then our measurement of what the apparent diffusion coefficient will go down. Okay. So this, this is still a very uh, standard part of protocols for looking at stroke. Uh, the exact mechanisms of this are still under, under study, but it is a fairly reliable clinical finding that um, stroke does tend to um, decrease diffusivity in, in the damaged region. And that's very obvious when you have a diffusion weighted image. <clears throat> Here's another example um, of a T2 weighted image. And you can sort of see here that there, there's clearly, you know, you could probably say that there's something different between the left and right side, but still, you know, you wouldn't necessarily say that the right side, you know, it may be hard for you to say what's wrong with the right side. It just looks different, right? Uh, if you have a diffusion weighted image, it's very clear that there's this area with, with altered diffusivity. And then if later on you also had an angiogram which you showed the blood flow, then that would also confirm that the blood supply to that area of the brain had been decreased. Um, there was some blockage in the vessel there. Okay, so let's do a couple of poll questions just to make sure we're all on the same page here. So let's to the first one. So the question is, um, if we increase the magnitude of the diffusion gradient, so those are the gradients we turn on and off, uh, what's gonna happen to the magnitude of the diffusion weighted signal? Will it increase or decrease? Let's go ahead and take a look at that and, and put in your best answers. Okay, about 10 more seconds. Okay, let's look at, take a look. So once again, about 50-50. So um, let's take a look at um, what's gonna happen. So remember, if we go back to this picture here, um, the reason why spins dephase is because they experience much different parts, they do experience different magnetic fields, right? So if we have spins, if we increase the diffusion gradient amplitude, so make that steeper, so let's say I made this much steeper, then as the spin moves around, the magnetic fields it experiences are gonna be much different, more different, okay? And so in general, a population of spins will experience many, many different more magnetic field uh, variations if the gradient is steeper. So that would tend to, as we increase the gradient amplitude, that will tend to uh, 
increase the magnetic field homogeneity. So therefore increase dephasing and therefore we would expect that the diffusion signal would tend to go down, right? Okay. And we can also see that from the B factor. If we look at the B factor, that B factor is proportional to the gradient squared term. And since uh, the signal is exponential minus BD, as B gets bigger, uh, that's gonna make the signal go down, okay? So either from the formula or from just sort of thinking about what causes um, dephasing, um, that would, that would, those would both give you the same answer. Okay. All right, let's like a, take a look at the second one. If we decrease the spacing, so basically we turn on the gradient in one amplitude and then we wait, we shorten the time we wait before we turn on the gradient in the other uh, uh, direction. And if we do that, so all we're doing is we're shortening the time of experiments, what do we expect to happen to the magnitude of the DWI signal? Will it increase or decrease? Okay, about 10 more seconds. Okay, let's take a look. So uh, yeah, so most people said that it would increase and that that's correct. So basically if we don't allow enough time for them to diffuse, right? Then they're not gonna go out so far and they're not going to get out of phase as much. And so we would tend to see that signal increase um, as that time gets shorter. So, so we would expect that to increase. We can also look back here in terms of the B value, that delta term, B go, if delta goes down, then B will go down. And so therefore, if B goes down, then EXP minus B, B will go up, assuming that B is the same. So that's some sort of basic intuition behind um, what is behind the diffusion weighted signal. And so that's, uh, certainly very, um, you know, very, very standard clinical sequence that you will see uh, used um, if you're ever associated with this research study or, you know, happen to be, uh, you know, getting an MRI uh, for yourself. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, primarily research right now, although becoming more used clinically as well. And that's basically looking at what's called DTI or diffusion tensor imaging. And so the idea there is that, um, you know, so far we've only really talked about water just diffusing or, or some particles diffusing. And so we've, we've made the explicit, explicit assumption that that's isotropic diffusion. Okay? So basically the, the particles can diffuse in any direction that they want and the, the, direct, the ability for them to diffuse is equal among all directions. Now, so that's represented here as isotropic diffusion. Now, in the presence of biological structures or any structures, um, there's gonna be preferred directions for um, particles to diffuse. So for example, if I put a particle in a forest of aligned uh, rods, then they can diffuse more easily in this direction along the rods. If they go perpendicular the rods, they're gonna hit the rods a lot. And so they're not gonna be able to diffuse as easily. And so that's what's called anisotropic diffusion where something about the structure of the medium is inhibiting diffusion in one direction such that there's a preferred direction of diffusion. <clears throat> so the nice thing about MRI is actually we can measure that direction by simply applying gradients in different directions, okay? So for example, in this case, if we apply gradients such that we're sensitive to diffusion in the left-right direction, you sort of see there's a lot of signal loss here. Okay, that means there's a lot of diffusion in going left to right. Okay, we can change the gradient such that we change the fields that they're going what's called anterior to posterior. And you can sort of see here that the signal is not very decreased. So that means there's probably not much diffusion going in the anterior posterior direction. And here is going into the, the, the gradient is along the, uh, the axis that's pointing into 
the uh, image. And so here, you can sort of see that all along here, it's pretty bright. And so that means that there's not much diffusion going into uh, the page at that point in time. Uh, so what happens is you can sort of basically acquire, you, you can, you know, the, the diffusion direction, you have full control over GX, GY, and GZ. So simply by changing the relative amplitudes of those, you can have your gradient vector point in lots of different directions. And so therefore you can actually measure diffusion in lots of different directions. So we said, you know, a very simple model is that the diffusion will follow so have this ellipsoidal type shape. And so you could, you might say that, well, you know, three directions is sufficient to um, capture that shape. Um, and that would certainly tr be true for 2D, but for 3D, it turns out you need, you'll, you'll have to have six directions, okay? And then in general, um, you need even more than that. Um, and, and typically more, more than is needed is required because imagine if, you know, as you're acquiring the data, there's always measurement error, okay? No, no measurement is ever, ever sort of, you know, exactly what you want. So um, if you have just three directions and this one is an error, let's say you, you measured it, it was too short, okay? So the red shows what you measured, then you would actually fit the ellipsoid you fit. This is your fit and this would be the true you'd have some error in what you fit, okay, in terms of your estimate. Whereas you see here, if, if I have many more directions, and even if I have these errors, these, these red ones are an error, when I do the best fit, I still end up with a fairly good correspondence between what's correct and what's, um, uh, what, we, what we estimate from our measurements, even though there is measurement error. So you'll often see that, you know, although you could get away with maybe six or seven directions, that many uh, protocols will use maybe 30 directions or 40 directions. And so we'll really sample diffusion in many, many directions because that just makes it uh, our, our overall estimation process less uh, sensitive to any measurement error. And so what at the end of the day is we can sort of characterize this diffusion ellipsoid, okay? And what we really care about is um, what are called the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. Okay, so it turns out any ellipsoid can be characterized by eigenvalues and eigenvectors where the eigenvectors tell you where the axes of the ellipsoid are and the eigenvalues tell you how long they are. So just to show why that's a useful concept, these are three ellipsoids and they're all um, sort of oriented in different directions. But if you look at their eigenvalues, they're all the same. Okay, they all have the same set of eigenvalues where the fact that there's one that's larger than the others tells you that that's the principal axis. That's the longest axis of that ellipsoid. And here are the, the eigenvectors. So here the principal eigenvector is one zero zero. So we know that this is, you know, this corresponds to that largest eigenvalue. Okay. And so the eigenvalues are all the same and it's just the eigenvectors as we are rotating an ellipsoid that change. So it turns out in diffusion tensor imaging, we're gonna both use the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. Uh, the eigenvalues are very useful for basically just characterizing how anisotropic are we, okay? So a very uh, common used metric is what's called FA or fractional anisotropy. And so you can sort of see, let's say we had lambda one equal lambda two equals lambda three, okay? If all the axes were of equal length, that would be isotropic um, diffusion. So in that case, FA would be zero. So that makes sense. Uh, there's no fractional isotropy when it's isotropic. And then as those eigenvalues turn out to have different values, let's say one gets very big and the other stays small, then this FA will tend to get larger. And so this is a um, example of some images. So we have a T2-weighted image here. And here we're plotting out the FA map, okay? And this is showing um, sort of that, what you're seeing here is most of the fractional isotropy in this image is really limited to the white matter of the brain, right? And so that's the wiring of the brain, the sort of the myelin coated, uh, the, the sheaths of your, your fibers, your axons are coated with myelin. 
which is sort of this this barrier that prevents water from flowing, um, you know, perpendicular to the axis. And so um, you do tend to see this very strong fractional isotropy in the white matter uh, of the brain. So the wiring of the brain is very well characterized with diffusion tensor imaging. Now, the other thing you can do is you can use both fractional isotropy, sort of have an idea of how anisotropic things are. And then you also have the eigenvectors, which are telling you which way you think that the principal direction of diffusion is going. And so you can sort of, for every voxel in the brain, if we zoom in on this, you can sort of have this little ellipsoid, right? And then you can sort of just connect those ellipsoids along their principal directions. And if you do that, you can end up with what are called these white, you sort of map these white matter tracks through the brain. And so the amazing thing is that this is gonna be done all non-invasively. There's no injection of any contrast agent. And what I find really amazing even now is that, you know, you can literally put someone into the MRI system for eight and a half minutes, and you end up with this amazing picture of their, their wiring, okay? And it's all done non-invasively. And if you put them in there even longer, you can get even better images. But um, even with just eight and a half minutes, um, which is fairly standard now for a lot of studies, you actually get these sort of incredible looking um, uh, sort of wiring diagram of the brain which really is not possible any other way. This is really, um, you know, the only other ways of doing this are you can inject some contrast into the brain and, and follow one fiber at a time, but that requires then, you know, uh, sacrificing the subject and, and looking at, you know, their images, you know, maybe under a microscope. And so this really is sort of amazing that uh, this technology um, can do this and, and it really has revolutionized sort of the study of, of the uh, wiring of the brain. And so, you know, it, it's safe enough that you can even apply it to young children. And so this is showing the wiring of the brain from two weeks to one year to adult. And you can sort of see that the wiring continues, develops a lot um, uh, over the course of a lifetime. Yeah. Okay, so um, why don't we switch to, uh, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, let's switch to this, uh, some questions. So, um, as diffusivity becomes more isotropic, the fractional and isotropy will either increase or decrease. So that's the first question. So just basic testing, sort of whether you you understand what FA might stand for. So this FA is stands for this is whoops sorry the FA. Okay, about 10 more seconds. Okay, let's take a look. Um, so yes, most people said that it will decrease and that's correct. So basically, you know, as it becomes more isotropic, right, all the eigenvalues should be equal and it should become less anisotropic, right? So therefore the fractional anisotropy should also decrease, okay? So in fact, if it is completely isotropic, the FA will be zero as we talked about, all right? Okay, let's do the uh, next one. Um, if the number of diffusion directions is decreased, the sensitivity of measurement error will either increase or decrease.
Okay, about 10 more seconds. Okay, let's take a look at this one. Um, so yeah, so as we have less directions, then our fitting process is gonna be much more sensitive to any one error in any direction. So we're generally better off with more directions. Obviously we don't wanna do too many directions because otherwise the scan will take too long, but there is generally some gain in going to more directions than you need because then an error in any one direction will not sort of bias the results so much. And so in general, as we decrease the sensitivity, um, as we decrease the number of directions and the sensitivity to measurement error will increase. Okay, so that, it's good to see most people got that. Okay. All right, so that's all we're gonna talk about for diffusion. Um, and so today we're really going over lots of different uh, applications that some of you will be touched upon in some of the projects, um, but this is just for sort of giving some basic ideas on how to think about these. The next thing we wanna talk about so we, so far we've talked about what happens when there's random motion, but now we want to talk about what happens when there's coherent motion and talk about how MRI can be used to measure uh, flow, okay, which is obvious is very important for biological applications. So once again, we have our picture of two spins, A and B. In this case, A is stationary, so that would be like the tissue, and B is flowing, and so that would be like a spin in the blood. Okay, so you're going to have some water protons in the background tissue. And we're going to ignore diffusion for now. And then we're going to have some spins that are in uh, fluid. So for example, it could be um, blood in, in, in a vessel, or it could be cerebral spinal fluid. So you have a lot of fluids moving through your brain and down through your spine. Um, and those have these sort of interesting dynamics. And so the techniques we're going to talk about now can be used to quantify anything that's flowing coherently uh, in, in, the, in the biological tissue. So once again, we have this picture where we're gonna wait up some amount of time and it's a negative gradient, right? So both of them sort of lag behind their original zero phase where they get they accrue positive phase because it's they're lagging behind. So the counterclockwise rotation. And you notice that this spin here has moved out here. So his actual, so this went back 90 degrees, right? And this went back 135 degrees because it moved out into a stronger part of the gradient field. So it, it got more phase accrual. Then we play the same trick we did in diffusion where we reverse the gradient and this spin that's stationary, right? This spin never moved. So we applied a gradient of one for, you know, of some area and then we rephase it with a gradient of equal and opposite area. So at the end of the day, this has phase of zero, okay? Whereas this spin here kept moving out into even farther and farther, uh, stronger parts of the gradient. And so instead of being rephased, it's overcompensated. So it went back 135 degrees, but it looks like it came back um, by, what is that? 135 plus 45. Um, so maybe like 180 degrees or something, okay? So because it's a stronger part of the field now. So it overcompensated. And so now it's accrued some net phase. And it turns out the phase it's accrued is proportional to the velocity. Because right? the farther it out it moves, the more phase it will accrue. Okay. So it turns out that um, the phase of any spin, we can represent it as simply the, the integral of its sort of frequency. So remember frequency is, the, uh, phase is just the integral of frequency. And uh, we previously described this as gamma times delta V, which is gamma times G dot R. And then we have GX, X, GY, Y, GZ, Z. And previously we assumed that the X, previously X sub tau was just X naught, right? Everything was constant. Now we're gonna say what happens when that X position is changing with time. And so we can do very simple motion where we can say, okay, let's say X, if X is some initial position plus some um, uh, velocity term plus some acceleration term. What that does allows us to do is rewrite the phase in terms of minus gamma times the position times some um, zeroth order moment times the velocity times the first order moment times the acceleration over two times second order moment. Okay, where these moments are either the area of the gradient, which you already saw when we talked about case space 
It could be the gradient, the first moment, which is gradient times time integrated, or it can be the second order moment, which is the gradient times tau squared integrated over time. Okay. So this is just summarizing that, that, um, you know, let's say, let's say we, we want to just focus on these first two order moments, right? So if the area is zero, right, then M naught, M, this zeroth order moment will go to zero. Okay, so we can ignore that term. And so if we do that, and let's say we ignore acceleration for now, then we can have something where the phase is just proportional to velocity. And since we control the first order moment, we can then solve for velocity. If we measure the phase, we can always solve for velocity. Uh, that's shown here where this is a very simple, what are called flow encoding gradients, where we have the gradient on for some amount of time and then we negate it and turn it on for the same amount of time. And so this nice has the nice property where the area is equal to zero, right? And so we know that the first order moment is equal to zero. And the, uh, sorry, the zeroth order moment is zero and the first order moment is given by this term, G naught times T squared. So typical phase contrast and geography uh, examination, uh, you will measure the phase, okay? And, and then we'll typically acquire one measurement where we measure the phase with the gradients like this. And then we acquire, we flip both gradients and then we acquire another set of measurements where the gradients are flipped like that. And if you look at the difference of those two phases, uh, you get a term here that's uh, proportional to velocity and then these are the design parameters, G naught and T squared. And so we can always solve for velocity if we measure the phase and we also know these parameters here. So this is an example here of phase contrast and geography where um, this, is, this bottom plot here is showing you actually the velocities that are estimated with that. So in this case, um, on, on this curve here, the white is showing the flow direction in the AP direction. And so it's basically showing that this blood is flowing this way, away from what's called the circle of Willis. And here white is showing flow direction in the right left direction. So uh, blood flow going this way here and then black is showing blood flow in the opposite direction, all right? The interesting thing is you can actually do this uh, multiple times and you can even for example if you're looking at the heart you could do this multiple stages in the cardiac cycle and you can also do this in different directions so you can get x y and z and time and if you do that that leads to something called 4d flow okay so we're, we're going to measure blood flow and at every point in time we're going to get all the components vx vy vz and we're also going to measure at different points um, in in the cardiac cycle and so this leads to some pretty astounding pictures here um, where you can sort of see the blood flow going through the brain, uh, going through the heart um, throughout the cardiac cycle. It's the amazing thing that this is all done non-invasively. Um, and uh, the way to do this has been known for quite a long time. I mean, this is, this technology is, is uh, you know, since the early nineties or so has been known how to do it, but it wasn't really until, uh, you know, with advances in computing visualization over the last five or 10 years, especially with GPUs and things that this has become more, um, uh, you know, widely used. In fact, one of the companies that's doing this is actually was started by uh, a graduate student here who took this class way back. The first time we offered this class was in 2003. And, and so one of the he actually went off and, and, and did some work at Stanford and, and started a company, which is now one of the leaders in, in doing this sort of imaging um, of 4D flow. Okay. So we're gonna talk about one artifact, um, which is aliasing. So we've talked a little bit about aliasing in imaging and, and it does turn out that aliasing occurs a lot of times when you're measuring flow. So for those of you who take, for example, B280B next year, uh, you may find out that, you know, there we use color Doppler or Doppler shift to measure velocity and there can be aliasing there when you measure velocity. And so typically um, for a lot of techniques, when you're trying to measure velocity, there's could always be this sort of what's called aliasing. And why is that? Well, imagine that 
you know, we said that the phase depends on velocity, right? So let's say the phase was this way, right? And that was some velocity going in one direction. But there's no way to distinguish that really from something with some other phase, like minus, let's call it minus phi one, which is a spin going in the other direction at a higher velocity. And so that there's this sort of uncertainty of, of you know, which way was the spin going? Was it going to the right at some velocity or was it going to the left at some other velocity? And so the way we define that is we say that V bank is the velocity at which a spin has pi phase, okay? So that means the bank is where I've gone from here to there. So that's phi of pi, okay? And if a spin is going more than the bank, then it's going to be aliased, right? Because it's going to go past that point at which point I don't really know which direction it is at, okay? So this is an example here where we're looking at a phase contrast study of the pulmonary artery where the bank is set too low at 15 centimeters per second. And you can sort of, sort of see there's flow that's going one direction in white and black in the other direction, okay? And so if you didn't really know much about how MRI worked, then you might think that, oh my gosh, this person has a really, has a problem in their artery. Maybe there's some weird turbulent flow, the blood flow is going back and forth. Maybe we need to operate on this person. But if you knew something about bank, you might say, well, why don't we acquire another image with a higher bank? And so th in this case, they increase the bank to 30 centimeters per second. And in this case, it looks just fine, okay? Because there's been no aliasing of the velocity. Um, and this can happen even, and, and so why does that, why, does, why do, were we getting that aliasing? It's because even, you know, for those of you in bioengineering, you know about laminar flow or, you know, mechanical engineering or fluid dynamics. So you know that velocity at the center can be very different from the velocity at the borders of a vessel. And so even within a vessel, if your bank is not set correctly, you know, the ones that are way, the very fast spins in the center, if the alias will appear like they're going the other direction unless you um, take that into account. Okay, so we're gonna skip over these questions, but let's just, um, with just that basic knowledge, I'm just gonna throw out one more question uh, before we move to portable MRI. So um, let's say the bank is set to five centimeters per second and blood is flowing to the right at seven centimeters um, per second. Uh, how will it appear? Will it appear as it's flowing to the right? Oh, I think, yeah, in this case, there's, there's, I, it's not set up for the pole. So just tell me what, you, what it looks like it's flowing to the right or to the left. Um, oh, hold on. Let me just end this poll. Let, we'll set up with A and B. Just, just a minute. Okay, so select either A or B. Uh, don't worry about this part here. We'll enter that later. So just tell me whether you think the blood is flowing to the right or to the left. Okay, about 10 more seconds. Okay, let's take a look at the results. So most people uh, said it was going to the left and so that, that is the correct answer. So let's take a look at that. So remember, if we think about on a unit circle, we said that the bank is, so this is phi of 180 degrees, right? For a velocity of um, five centimeters per second. Okay. And let's assume that this way is going to the right. Okay, so that's the face. So if I was going at seven centimeters per second, I would use up most of my budget just getting here. And then I would overshoot um, by some amount of phase. So two centimeters per second of overshoot. Right, that I go past that. 
So the other way I could have got it there is I could have gone this way, right? Three centimeters per second. Okay. And so therefore the blood would appear as if it's flowing to the left at three centimeters per second. Right. So if I saw that and I saw weird blood flow, then the, the simplest thing is to then just increase the bank value and, and verify that with a higher bank value, um, there's no there's no flow there. So that is something where you know all radiological technicians and radiologists sort of need to be aware a little bit of you know how their methods work because um, you know having some knowledge of how the methods work is important for deciding whether something's an artifact or whether it's an actual pathology that needs to be addressed. Right. Okay, so we're gonna switch gears one more time and we're gonna, oh, we're talking about inflow effect, which is the last way, uh, sort of one more way of measuring blood flow. Uh, the reason I like to talk about this one is because it's actually a nice um, sort of uh, principle to remember, especially as you're doing your research or you know, you're working um, say in industry. Um, MRI is filled with examples where, uh, you know, there's been an artifact or a problem where, you know, someone looks at the image and says, oh my gosh, there's this terrible thing. Everything, you know, all the blood appears bright in this image. It's really screwing up the image. Um, what do I do about this? And so in one sense, it's a problem. It, it's something where, you know, um, the blood is appearing brighter than it should appear. Um, but it turns out that a lot of times those artifacts then become actually new methods. And so someone else could say, well, actually that's really good that because I want to be able to see the blood. Uh, and, and if I can just sort of see the really bright blood, then that's a great angiogram. So um, this inflow effect is both considered an artifact and also an, a, a signal of interest. And how does it work? Well, imagine you have blood flowing into some uh, image. And what you're doing is you're applying a lot of RF pulses. Okay, so lots of RF pulses continuously. Okay. And typically low flip angle. So if I'm a spin, sitting here, right? If I'm at some spin sitting here, um, flowing in, so um, let's say I'm flowing here and only the spins sort of in this region experience the RF pulses, right? So this, these spins, uh, everything shifts one, sorry. Let's, everything shifts one over from step to step, okay? So you're imagining spins flowing in. So I'm looking at different time snapshots of those spins. So this is spin experience. These spins experience one RF pulse. Now this experience zero RF pulses. So it's still fully relaxed. I go to the next phase. This has experienced zero RF pulses. This has experienced one. And these have all experienced two RF pulses. Okay, assuming that we've been able to apply RF pulses in just a little band here. Okay. So if I go here, now that's zero, one, two, three, 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 three. And I can keep going and forth. And so what you notice is that all the spins that are sort of within some region are gonna be very saturated, right? And all of the inflowing, the fresh spins are gonna be much brighter. And in particular, the spins that aren't moving at all, the ones that are in the tissue behind sort of supporting all the vessels, those will be really saturated such that at the end of the day, the only thing that's gonna be bright is those fresh flowing spins that didn't experience as many RF pulses as all the background tissue. So this is this concept of magnetic saturation where we have these repetitive RF pulses such that the tissue within the region becomes saturated, okay? We basically knock down that signal to almost zero and anything that's outside the slab flows in with fresh magnetization such that it is gonna be appear bright against a very dark background. And so that's what we get here. So you notice this is sort of a, an axial slice and you can sort of see that where there are vessels it appears relatively much brighter than the background tissue. Okay. Uh, and then we can do different visualization. This is what's called a maximum intensity projection where we sort of take the brightest voxels along any axis and just project them onto our image. And you have these very nice depictions of the cerebral vasculature. Okay. So this is also, this is what's called time of flight angiography and is also a very standard um, uh, technique for looking at the uh, vasculature of the human brain. And, and other parts of, of the body as well. Okay, so we're gonna spend a few minutes uh, for the rest of the lecture just talking a little bit about portable MRI and, and sort of what's maybe uh, 
coming down the pike, you know, what are things to look out for, and especially, you know, over the next, uh, you know, five, 10, uh, 20 years. So as we've talked about before that, you know, the current MRIs, um, they use these very powerful magnets. Okay. And the problem is that that leads to a lot of cost. Okay. So in this plot, it's saying about 38% um, of the, the cost of, of the MRI system is really the magnets and cryostat. You can see another big part of the cost is the gradient amplifiers. Remember, the, we have these very powerful amplifiers that are creating these huge amounts of current to make the gradients go on and off. And so there's a lot of interest in reducing cost and also making things portable. portable. Okay, there's this concept in medicine of POC or point of care. So right now, right now, you know, if you want to get an MRI system, uh, an MRI image of your body, then it's not necessarily that easy to do. Uh, you have to make an arrangement to go visit an imaging center. There might be a backlog. You might have to wait four weeks to get your imaging done. Um, you might have to drive somewhere that's not convenient for you. So that all adds cost and time to the medical process. So there's a lot of interest in the medicine in terms of trying to make medicine uh, more cost effective. And one of those concepts is really delivering uh, sort of these technologies at the point of care. So when point of care is, for example, instead of having to go to um, some imaging center, if you had a machine at the bonds or at the CVS, you know, you could just go get an MRI uh, scan done uh, very in a very convenient fashion. And obviously if it's gonna be um, there, it's gotta be very low cost and very easy to cite, okay? So right now, a lot of the cost that's um, in the magnet in setting up these um, MRI systems is sometimes they're saying that even just the cost of creating the space. So let's say an MRI system costs a million dollars. It may cost you a million dollars just to get the construction and, and all the sort of the, the ventilation and everything ready for your MRI system. So that's not very cost effective. And so uh, people are always looking at sort of, are there different sort of business opportunities, um, different operational opportunities to make medical imaging more accessible? So we're just gonna go through some of that here just to give you a sense of, uh, you know, what people are thinking of. This is one that was just announced um, in the last week or so from Siemens and it's called the Magneton FreeMac. So this is not portable, but it is a lot less um, heavy than a typical MRI. So it's only about, it's less than three tons, which um, is still considered like an MRI and it doesn't use much liquid helium, okay? And you can sort of see here, no quench pipe is necessary. The, so the quench pipe is what releases the liquid helium gets it out of the building so that people don't suffocate. If you remember the MRI safety exam uh, video, you know, if there's helium, it will take up the oxygen in the room and, and people can suffocate. So every MRI facility has to have this quench pipe to get rid of that excess helium in case there's a, what, in, in case the magnet loses its field and, and the liquid helium boils off. Okay. So this is sort of not portable, but sort of showing you where one of the vendors is going in terms of they're creating this very easy to install system uh, and they're making the trade-off that it's not a very high field strength so it's basically 0.55 tesla okay whereas you know more standard field strength might be 1.5 or 3 tesla per clinical um, this does have the advantage though for example you know it makes lung imaging much better okay and especially in this time of covid this could be uh, a real advantage that uh, because there's a lot of air in the lungs, there's a lot of susceptibility artifacts, such as the higher fields you go, it becomes very, very difficult to image in the lungs. And so going to lower field strength is actually an advantage for certain applications, such as imaging in the lungs. Okay. So that's a little one step in terms of you know, making MRIs a little more accessible. The next big step that was just announced this year is uh, this thing from this company called Hyperfine, which I believe one of the project group projects can look at. And so that this is this very portable, this is truly portable in the sense that, um, you know, you can just wheel it around. So it's like an ultrasound machine of that sort of the size. It's got wheels on it. So you can take it to whatever room you want. You could even have one of these, you know, in a retail outlet. Um, it's really, you know, very easy, great for kids because the parent could be just sitting there. Um, and you can sort of see that the image quality, this is sort of image quality in a normal subject here. Um, is okay. It's not, it's not as good as you would get 
with a high field MRI, like a 1.5 or 3 Tesla, but it's certainly good enough to see a lot of different pathologies. Okay, so the idea is for a lot of things, you may not need the best system for your initial look. And if you have something that you have a lot of these around, then this might actually be a good trade off. And it's much cheaper and it's portable. And so um, the question that's going to be occurring over the next few years is, you know, is this the way that a lot of medical imaging is going to go. Is this truly going to be sort of um, as uh, as useful as people think it is? One of the things that goes into this is because they're using they're using a very small field strength here. I believe it's I think it's 0.064 Tesla. So B naught equals that. So there's a lot of loss in sensitivity. And so one of the things that they're working on is that something we'll talk about next time is they're experimenting with deep learning and reconstruction. Basically, um, a lot of things that we've talked about so far have said that there's different limits that you have to meet. And what we'll talk about a little bit on Wednesday is how recent advances in deep learning and machine learning are allowing uh, people developing these systems to go beyond those limits and, and create even images with even uh, with new designs and, and new um, acquiring less data. Uh, finally, um, you know, we've talked about how, you know, for example, 1.5 Tesla is using very strong magnetic fields. We've seen some examples where um, people are lowering the fields. So from, you know, 1.5 to 0.064, you know, that's roughly a factor of, you know, 50 to 100. And the next thing is, can you go even lower? Okay. And so this is from Timeline, which is a sci-fi novel by Michael Crichton of Jurassic Park fame. And so here's here saying we're gonna use squids or superconducting quantum interference devices. Uh, and they're so sensitive, he says, that they can measure resonance in the Earth's magnetic field. So you don't have to use any magnets in there. So the question is, is that even possible? And so here's some work done at UC Berkeley where they used, um, they did have some magnetic field, um, but they actually use a very small magnetic field. And for their sensor, they use a squid. So this is a squid detector, which is a very, very sensitive detector. So basically, um, because if the magnetic field is reduced, then you're not going to really have much signal. So, but if you have a very, very sensitive detector, there may be a chance that you can still make images. And what they found was using a very small field, 132 micro Tesla. Okay, so that's about two, two to two and a half times the Earth's magnetic field. So that not that strong of magnetic field. Remember, the Earth's magnetic field around San Diego is about 50 microtesla. So just a little over twice that, they're able to make these actually reasonable looking images, okay? Of, in this case of a cross section through a bell pepper. And they've even uh, you know, shown some, some human images, okay? Um, and done at 130 microtesla. So at least in principle, it's possible whether it actually takes off or not. Um, it's not clear if it will. Um, one of the disadvantages of using squids is they have to be uh, cooled um, at, at, at uh, very low temperatures. And so that tends to make them even less, you know, there's still this issue of portability. Uh, but there are other approaches um, that may also be discussed in some of the projects. This is one, uh, this was actually a PhD thesis at MIT where uh, really looking at very portable um, MRI. And so what we said before, a, a very big, a uh, problem with um, MRI portability and cost is the gradient coils. These tend to be these very big coils. They require a lot of power. And so this was a very clever design where they essentially create a magnetic field using these permanent magnets in a circular array. And then they make it go around in a circle. Okay, so the gradients are created by having this, this magnetic field that's changing in time. And so you can imagine this thing is on, for example, rollers you could actually have this be very portable in the sense that even if you're out on, in the field or in the jungle, you could just have a bicycle or a hand crank turning this and acquiring the images, okay? And so, you know, they get quite respectable images uh, with this approach. Um, and then lastly, you know, people are even trying approaches where they can make it even more portable. For example, the idea is, you know, instead, of, you know, you could just go to your hair salon and. They could have this cap that fits on top of your head, and uh, once again, you know, using um, portable magnets here. So all the magnets are right here on the top of your head, 
and uh, made up of all these little cubes and by with some clever tricks and and in this case they do have some gradient coils in the cap itself uh, creating images okay so this is not as far along I mean I think they've created some very basic images so far um, but it's just going to show that you know all of MRI is a fairly mature technology there are still a lot that um, people are trying to do to sort of push it forward in terms of cost and portability. Um, and, and so I think over you know, the course of your careers, you'll probably be seeing many additional changes. Um, so why don't we stop there for today? Um, on Wednesday, we're gonna talk about sort of the next frontier of, of MRI in terms of image reconstruction. We'll talk a little about deep learning and as sort of how deep learning is really changing how um, people view uh, medical imaging and how that's going to play. It's already starting to play a big role in, in clinical imaging and, and probably is going to continue to play a very big role um, as the years continue. OK, so we'll stop there. And I will stick around for um, questions. And if you have any questions about the homework or the uh, your projects, feel free to ask me in office hours. Okay. Otherwise, we'll see you on Wednesday.